You guys have a good week this week? A little rainy, a little cold. It was just right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. School's out. Hallelujah. How many parents are glad for that? Exciting. <laughs> Amen. Well, hey, let's, uh, let's pray this morning. Uh, the title of my message is Common People Uncovered. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity that you give to us to, to share your word, to share in fellowship with the body of Christ. Uh, Father, we just ask that your presence would be here. Uh, Father, that you would open our hearts to receive that which you want to, to give to us. And I know that you're speaking to every one of us in a different way. So, Father, that uh, we would just be able as individuals and as families to understand uh, what it is that you're speaking to us. And, and maybe the struggles that we might be having today, God, that you would continue to, to walk us through those, those valleys, giving us your peace as we talked about. But, Father, also for those of us that are just in, in the mountaintop experience, Lord, we're just uh, experiencing your love and your grace in a very powerful way. Lord, help us to pray for those that are struggling and hurting. Lord, give us opportunity to, to share um, with other people about Christ. Father, continuing to, to forge ahead as the body of Christ. And we thank you for it. And everybody said amen. So there's a story of, uh, of this guy. He was traveling through the countryside. And he was kind of tired and worn out. So he goes into this diner. And uh, as he goes into the diner, he, he wanted to... He only wanted two things, and so the waitress comes up to him, and, and he says, I just want two things from you. The first thing I want is the pot roast, and the second thing I want is a good word. Encourage me today. I'm kind of tired. I'm kind of weary. I'm kind of struggling a little bit. And so the waitress went ahead and scribbled down his, his, his needs and started walking away, and, and the man said, hey, wait a minute. I wanted some words of encouragement. And so the waitress turned around and she said, the only word of encouragement that I could tell you this, this afternoon or this evening is don't get the pot roast. <laughs> How many of you like pot roast? Obviously in this place you don't get the pot roast. But I want to talk about this morning, the, the one thing that came to my mind is, uh, is transparency. Turn to your neighbor and say transparency. That waitress was pretty transparent, wasn't she? You know, she probably had a bad day too, you know. It's just like, hey, I don't want to give you a word of encouragement. But transparency. I want us to be transparent with ourselves. Take your finger and point, just point at yourself and say, self, I want you to be transparent with me. Because sometimes we're not, right? Sometimes we just don't call a spade a spade in our own lives. We just kind of keep floating along and floating along and floating along. I also want us to be transparent with God. Okay, sometimes we, uh, we put on this mask, and I thought that was so cool, Erica. That is so cool. And, and we put on this mask, and we think that God can't see through this mask that we put on. And the reality is that God is God, and he's greater than any, and he can see through any of that stuff. He can see through that superficial stuff that we put in front of him, right? And so why don't we just become transparent with him all the time? If we're mad, let's tell him we're mad. If we're struggling with sin, let's tell them we're struggling with sin. If we're not, let's tell them we're not. Let's be joyous, whatever it is, but let's be transparent. Turn your neighbor and say transparent. And why do we do this? Why do we, why do we want to be transparent? It's because we want to express the glory of God. Our function as the church is to express the glory of God. And if we can't be transparent in all those ways, I don't know if we'll be able to to, to, ex, uh, to express the glory of God. In my opinion, the greatest quality of a disciple of Jesus Christ is to be transparent. Now, there's a commercial, uh, and, and this company has, has done several little 30-second uh, commercials on transparency, and I want you to watch one of them. I've had a wonderful time tonight. Me too. Call me tomorrow? I'm going to send a vague text in a couple days that leaves you confused about my level of interest. I'll wait a full two days before responding. Perfect. <laughs> We're never going to see each other again, will we? No, no. Wouldn't it be great if everyone said what they meant? 
wouldn't it be great if everyone said what we meant? There's another one that I wanted to use where they're, uh, they're doing some remodeling in the home. And uh, the contractor comes in and says, says uh, you know, I'm just going to rip out this wall that doesn't need to get ripped out. And that's going to cost you a whole lot more money. How many of you have seen that one before? Transparency. Turn to your neighbor and say, transparency. Husbands, are you transparent with your wives? Wives, are you transparent with your husbands? Kids, children, are you transparent with your parents? Parents, you don't need to be transparent with your kids. <laughs> no, maybe you do. Transparency. Transparency, being transparent. Uh-oh, my thing just went out. Uh-oh. Ser sermon, sermon is cut short. Let me just say that. Sermon is cut short. What does it mean to be transparent? What does it mean to be transparent? Somebody, tell me, right here. Okay, be honest. Is there any, another word that you have deep down? The, what does that mean to you to be transparent? Okay, to be clear with your words and thought, to be honest. Anything else? Be real? Okay, yeah. And, and, and so are we being real? Are we as Christians being real to God? The definition that I found for transparency is, is having the property of transmitting light through a window is transparent it allows the light to come through john chapter 8 verse 12 says this then jesus spoke to them again saying i am the what light of the world he who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have light and that's what, that's what I'm talking about this morning is, is a, allowing our lives to be transparent and the light of Christ to come and shine in our lives. You know, in, in, uh, in Israel's day and time, they made pots, uh, pottery. And uh, they were so fragile that the, when the light shone, you could almost see through. It exposed the cracks and the, the, the imperfections of that pottery. And so what I'm, at, what I'm asking us to consider is that we allow the light of Christ to come and expose us as pottery, right? He is the potter, we are the? And so to come and just expose the cracks so that we can display Christ after we repent of sin or whatever it might be. Maybe we're having a bad day and we're in the funk. We're in a season of funk. How many are there? <laughs> You're just in a season of funk. And you need the light of Christ to come and shine on you. Light will always reveal the cracks and breaks in our lives. Can you say, oh me? You guys aren't tired this morning, are you? No? You're just excited? <laughs> You're tired? Yeah. And, hey, hey, parents, can you do something about that? Maybe get them, get them to bed at night? He is just being honest and transparent. Bless you. <laughs> if you and I are not willing to be transparent, allowing the light of Jesus Christ to come into our lives and, and expose those cracks, we're going to fail to express the glory of God. And so I want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Probably going to back up just a few verses but um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm trying to decide where I want to start here. Let me just start in verse 7. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel would not look steadily at the face of of Moses because the glory of his countenance which glory was passing away how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious for if the ministry of condemnation had glory the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because the glory that excels for if 
what is passing away was glorious. And this is talking about the old covenant. Lost my place. For even what was made glorious had no glory in it in this respect because the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a what? Veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Can you say amen? But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart, talking about Israel. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the what? Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, every one of us, with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is what makes a difference, church. The Spirit of the Lord is what makes the difference. I encourage all of us to read chapter 3, and we will understand that Paul compares the glory of God in the Old Testament to the glory of God in the New Testament. And he concludes that the glory of the Lord in the New Testament is way better than the glory of the Lord in the Old Testament. Now, why do I say that? Because the glory of the Lord in the New Testament is alive rather than dead. Can you say amen? It is alive rather than dead. The glory in the Old Testament was following what? The law. It was following the rules and regulations. I mean, if you wanted to get close to God, you had to do the yeses and the noes. I mean, what are, what are, are the commandments that God said Israel to follow? Huh? What are they? Do not, do not kill, do not steal, do not covet. Obey your father and your mother. Oh. Okay, but there was, there was like death in that. You know what I mean? There was, it was just ritual. It was just following. But that's the way God had it. But there was something new coming down the pipe, church, right? And that is righteousness. That is, the, that is Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Every one of us experiencing something fresh and new and alive. Turn your neighbor and say alive. That's the glory of the new covenant, the relationship with Jesus Christ. Glory in the New Testament is living in that uh, uh, vibrant relationship with Christ. If you're going through a difficult time, all you got to do is just bow. You don't even have to bow your knee. You don't have to climb the mountain. You just say, God, I need you. I need your spirit to come and dwell with me and encourage me and, and baptize me. Amen. Moses found out what it is like to behold the glory of God. How many remember that? And he said, please show me your glory. God, show me your glory. So what did God do? He threw him in the cleft of the rock, hit his face, and then what did God do? He passed by him. And then what happened after he got out of the cleft of the rock? His face was shining what I would say the Shekinah glory. And so what did Moses have to do when he came down to the people after he told the people about the law and all that kind of stuff? See, he had a moment with God. He had an encounter with God. And his face showed that he had an encounter with God. 
Some of us, church, we need to have an encounter with God and allow our face to show it. No, I just, I just wanted to look at Dean because he's very handsome this morning. <laughs> but when we have an encounter with God, it shows up in our life, church. When we have a relationship with God, it shows up in our life. It changes us. It renews us. Some of us need that aliveness in our life. Only through the presence of the Holy Spirit can you say amen. amen. Under the old covenant, only Moses ascended Mount Sinai to have fellowship with God. But under the new covenant, even you, Odessa, can have a relationship with God. And even you, ma'am, can have a relationship with God. And even you can have a relationship with God. You can have that live vibrance with the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. And you don't got to climb the mountain. Tim, you don't got to climb the mountain. Because climbing the mountain is tough, isn't it? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 and 8, the glory is passing away, but how much more glorious is the Holy Spirit illuminating Jesus Christ in our lives? Listen, church, it's the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that does the work through Christ, amen, in our lives. Then Paul talked about a mirror. How many of you looked in a mirror this morning? <laughs> Nobody looked in a mirror this morning? Yeah, come on. I know some of you guys were up there, you know, moving that one hair around, <laughs> you know, slicking back that Randall. I know. You had to shave that hair this morning, looking in that mirror, looking all fine. And so, you know, Paul talks about a mirror. As we look into the mirror, what is the mirror? It's God's word. When we look into that mirror, God's word, we see Jesus Christ all over it. Can you say amen? The Spirit of God transforms us into the image of God, and we are able to express the glory of God. The mirror. May I caution you not to hide yourself, not to put a veil over yourself like Moses did, but to take that veil off and allow the glory of God to shine. Amen. And so my question this morning is, how do we, what do we do? What are some things that we can do to allow that veil to come off in our life, to remove that veil in our life? And number one is desperation. Desperation. If you want to remove that veil in your life and allow yourself to be transparent before God, yourself, your family, whatever, you've got to be desperate. You've got to be desperate for God. I remember when uh, Karen and I probably had maybe one child, Emily, maybe two, Lauren, and uh, I was downstairs. How many has this happened to you where the husband's downstairs, the wife's upstairs, and she goes, Chris! Chris! You know, the blood-curdling scream, you know? And you're like, what is going on? And your first reaction is to just beeline it to wherever. Maybe you're in the garage, right, and just start screaming. Ah! It might just be a mouse, whatever. But that scream, that, that cry, it's in desperation. I need some help. And I think about that in our relationship with God. How many times do we get desperate for God? I don't care what the situation is. Maybe it's not even part of your family. It's just someone else. There's things going on. And how many of us are desperate for God? And, 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 and we would all say probably, yeah, I'm desperate for God. But then are you acting like it? Are, is your verbiage, is your body language, everything that you're doing, is it expressing being desperate for God or is it not? 
I look in Scripture and I see that God responds to people that are desperate. Okay? Who was that guy that uh, was, uh, was without food and he was in the hollow of a tree and a raven came and fed him? Okay? He was about to die, right? He's desperate for God and God answered his prayer. What was his name? Oh, you guys read that story too. What about King David? Create in me what? A clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Could you imagine the desperation he was in? Could you imagine the situation that he was going through? I mean, the, the, the discouragement that he faced. But yet he was desperate and he cried out to God. Oh, you guys aren't getting it this morning. Turn the air conditioning down a little bit more. Let's wake him up. Desperation. To the woman that was caught in sin, remember when they were going to stone her? And then Jesus came and rode in the sand? She was desperate to be delivered. She was desperate for something to happen in her life. How about the woman that was incurable of this disease for 12 years? And she was desperate just to touch the hem of his garment. And she went through the crowd pushing people. I can imagine kneeing them in the stomach and hitting them in the face. And No, that's not what she did. She crawled and she crawled and she crawled. She lowered herself just to touch. She was desperate to get something from God, from Christ. How about the family whose little girl was dead? the leader of the army or whatever, Jarius. He was desperate for his daughter to be healed. What about the blind Bartimaeus? Desperation. Desperation. I'm a little concerned, church. I'm a little concerned that I'm not desperate enough. I'm a little concerned that we as the church are not desperate enough for God to move in our lives, in our community, in our homes. I'm a little concerned. Should I be concerned? Desperation. Desperation. I'm thankful, though, when we choose to cry out to God, that He hears us. How does He hear us? And how does He answer? Through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Number two, dedicated. You want to take that veil off? You want to be transparent? You got to be desperate? You got to be dedicated. Dedicated. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. Whether you or I like it, God has set us apart as Christians from this world unto himself to influence it, not indulge in it. How about Daniel? Was Daniel, remember the Old Testament Daniel? Was he dedicated? How was he dedicated? Someone tell me how he was dedicated. Huh? Prayer, okay, prayer. How else? Huh? Huh? Food. What happened? What was the deal with the food? Yeah, the king said, I want you to eat all my foods. I want you to eat the meat. I want you to eat the whatever it was. And Daniel said, no, I don't want to do that. Now, did it, get him in, did it get him in trouble? It did. Because he had a guard. I mean, there was a guard that was watching over him. And said, no, 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 Daniel, you're going to eat the, eat the food. And he said, wait a minute. I could just see that conversation, right? I mean, he's like, hey, let, let's, let's make a deal here. And so he said, this is what we're going to do, if you'll allow it. Instead of eating the meat and all the stuff that the king said, how about for 10 days you allow me to eat what? Vegetables. And then you compare me with the other young guys my age that are eating the king's meat. And if I look better than them, then I get to keep eating the, the vegetables. And what happened? 
After the 10 days, Daniel looked worse, right? He didn't? He looked better than the, those that were eating the meat from the king. He was dedicated. Now, we don't want to get into the whole story, but he was dedicated to the Lord. He didn't want to partake in the things that the king wanted him to. Dedication. Dedication. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, For we are his workmanship. You are his workmanship. What does that translate? You are his poetry. You are God's poem to the world around you. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Dedicated means devoted to a task or purpose. This morning, are you dedicated to the task and purpose that God has for you? And the last one is this, devoted. So what was number one? To take that veil off? Common people uncovered, what is it? Desperation. Number two is what? Dedicated. Dedicated. And number three is what? Devoted. Well, you say, Pastor Chris, that's the same thing. Dedication and devotion, it's the same thing. Not in my view, it's not. If you're dedicated, you're dedicated to a, a system. You're dedicated to the, the process. Devoted means that you are devoted to the person. Are you dedicated and devoted this morning? If you are devoted to something, you are reliable, loyal, faithful, committed, dependable, consistent, steadfast to a person. Husbands and wives, oh, isn't that special? When you look up devotion in the dictionary, do you see your picture next to it? <laughs> With that big smiley face. <laughs> Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. First Chronicles twenty two nineteen says this, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Therefore, arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy articles of God into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. Your life is a temple. Your life is a tabernacle. Are you devoted to God to build that? 1 Kings 11.4 says this, For it is so when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his, heart af uh, turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal or, paraphrase, devoted. See, that's what happens, church. When we are not devoted, our heart gets turned. Can you say amen? It's for every one of us to be mindful of where we are in our relationship with the Lord. You want to uncover your soul and experience the glory of God, you gotta be desperate. You gotta be what? And you gotta be what? John, would you come please? Stand with me please. Some of you are thinking, oh my goodness, he is done already? I know, I kind of surprised myself. <laughs> we got a lot going on today, though, so. You guys came at the right time, man. If you're a guest with us, you, man, you're like, whoa, this is amazing. I'm coming back to church. He only preaches 10 minutes. Where's John? Oh, there he is. Your team can come, too, if you want. Worship team, come on up here. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's devotion. 
kind of serious business, though, you know what I'm saying? What does, uh, what does our text say? But, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so that just as by the Spirit of the Lord, that's saying that that is what carries the relationship, the opportunity for us to have an unveiled face. The Spirit of the Lord, alive, fresh, new. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you don't have a, an alive, fresh relationship with Jesus Christ or with God through Jesus Christ. The Bible just tells us that we got to surrender. Amen? We just got to surrender. Ask for forgiveness. Say, God, I've never really had this before, but I need something different in my life. I need something alive and vibrant. I wake up in the morning and I'm mad. I go to work and I'm mad. I come home and I'm even madder. <laughs> I don't get along with people, whatever it is. Hallelujah. You guys got a song for us? I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, that God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. Transparency. Amen. Transparency. Being transparent before God. Taking that veil off. Allowing the old to pass away and that vibrancy in Christ to come. Many of us have experienced that. But some of us may not have. I encourage you 
If you start looking into this thing right here, what is this called? Start looking into it. Isn't that what Paul says? As in a mirror. Start looking at it and it will transform. There will be newness beginning to, to develop in your life. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word this morning. Thank you, God, that there is life through your word. There's life through relationship with you made possible by your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I'm thinking of people this morning that are, are struggling in what I would say the joy of the Lord. Father, I struggle at times with the joy of the Lord in my life. Man, we just get so bogged down and and our mind gets so switched to the things of this world. Problems, situations, whatever it is, and we start to fixate on that. Even one of the songs, God, that we sang this morning talked about keeping our eyes on you rather than our situation. And then that vibrancy just starts to wane. And all of a sudden we realize that that our relationship is not good with you. Father, restore unto us the joy of thy salvation. Restore unto us as your church a desire to look into your word and begin to, to see once again your working and, and moving and, and how powerful and great you are, how much you love people. Father, we just thank you for leading us through dry seasons, valleys in our lives so that we can experience you in a new, fresh way in each season. Father, we pray that you would watch over us uh, this afternoon. Give us wisdom today in the board meeting, our piano business meeting. Lord, we're thinking about the food, and we pray you'd bless all those individuals today that brought food. And Lord, as we partake, God, that it would bring nourishment to our bodies today. Father, we thank you for the blessings you give to us every single day, even the ones that we don't even realize you're doing for us. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and everybody said, amen. God bless you. Remember, stick around. Let's have some food. Let's have a business meeting, and then let's go home. Amen. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe.